This is a mechanism of disease map for type 2 diabetes. I'll be talking about the etiologies of type 2 diabetes, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations. And in general, these categories will flow from left to right on this flowchart. All of the boxes in this mechanism of disease map are color-coded according to these core concepts and the legend up here. <clears throat> so you'll be able to keep them straight in your head according to this legend. First, let's start with the etiologies on the left. There's a long list of risk factors for type 2 diabetes. I'll go through them one by one. Family history is the first one. If you have a first-degree relative with type 2 DM, that predisposes you to developing it yourself. Race and ethnicity also play a role. This is a social determinant of health. In the United States, at least, Native Americans and African Americans have higher rates of type 2 diabetes. Physical inactivity or sedentary lifestyle also predisposes to diabetes. History of cardiovascular disease, such as if you've had heart attacks or stents or a cabbage procedure, also predisposes you to type 2 diabetes. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is associated with type 2 DM. And it's thought that insulin resistance plays a role in the pathophysiology of polycystic ovarian syndrome as well. There are other conditions that are associated with insulin resistance. This includes severe obesity and a high calorie diet. Those also predispose you to type 2 DM. In addition, hypertension, dyslipidemia, or high cholesterol. And lastly, if you've had a history of gestational diabetes during pregnancy, you're at higher risk of type 2 diabetes. There are some genetic factors that also play a role. There's no known specific um, actual targeted um, factors, but in general, the studies have shown that children with one diabetic parent have a 40% risk of type 2 diabetes. In addition, in the twin studies, monozygotic twins have a concordance of over 75% for type 2 diabetes. All of these etiologies, these risk factors and genetic factors, lead to the same pathophysiology for type 2 diabetes. And it involves broadly these three processes. Visceral adiposity, that's obesity around your abdomen, where your um, abdomen is larger than your waist. This also involves a low-grade chronic inflammation, kind of a smoldering long-term process, and that induces oxidative and metabolic stress on other parts of the body. To get into a little more detail in this column, we'll talk about what actually happens when you have this adiposity, this chronic inflammation, and this oxidative and metabolic stress on the rest of the body. And it gets a little complicated, but if you're going to remember only two things, remember that type 2 diabetes is caused by peripheral insulin resistance and dysfunction of the pancreatic beta cells. Now, I'll get into more detail, but again, if you can only remember a few things about the pathophysiology, peripheral insulin resistance and dysfunction of pancreatic beta cells. So for peripheral insulin resistance, when you have this central adiposity, you have increased levels of free fatty acids in your blood. So increased plasma levels of free fatty acids. This results in impaired insulin dependent glucose uptake in your cells. Your cells include hepatocytes, myocytes, and adipocytes, and they're not able to take in glucose when insulin asks them to. That's peripheral insulin resistance. In addition, you'll have increased serine kinase activity in your fat and skeletal muscle cells. This results in phosphorylation of insulin receptor substrate IRS1 and decreased affinity of IRS1 for the PI3K. This results in decreased expression of GLUT channels, which results in decreased cellular glucose uptake. So in essence, you'll have a shortage of these channels, GLUT4 channels, GLUT4 channels, and you'll have decreased cellular glucose uptake. These channels are what allow glucose to go into the cells and you'll have less of them. That also contributes to peripheral insulin resistance. Now these mechanisms of peripheral insulin resistance also directly link to the dysfunction of pancreatic beta cells. When you have insulin resistance, when you're not responding to insulin, you have low insulin sensitivity, you'll have a higher demand for glucose-lowering hormones. Glucose-lowering hormones include insulin and also amylin, which is another polypeptide that is secreted with insulin and helps to decrease your glucose in your blood. When you have high production of proinsulin and proamylin, the enzymes that break those down can't keep up. You'll have so much proinsulin and so much 
amylin that you can't get rid of them. You can't move them downstream in their, um, in their biochemical processes. This leads to an accumulation of proamylin, which then reduces the ability of your body to make more. This results in the dysfunction of pancreatic beta cells, where you have this accumulation of proamylin, which then results in decreased endogenous insulin production. So these two things are kind of linked, but the dysfunction of pancreatic beta cells is, a, is definitely a downstream effect of these processes as well. You essentially have so much insulin production, so much amylin production, that you're unable to make any more later on. There are some genetic factors that are known to directly correlate with the dysfunction of pancreatic beta cells as well. There are other pathophysiologies that are worth knowing. One is in the blood retinal barrier, where you'll have a microangiopathy of the retinal vessels, and this can lead to macular edema. And we'll later talk about how that can affect your vision as well. In any case, these pathophysiologies of type 2 diabetes um, usually don't happen very suddenly. Initially, when these things start happening, you'll have some compensation. Your body will be able to secrete more insulin to make up for um, the problems that are listed here. Over time, your insulin secretion capacity will decrease and you'll no longer be able to secrete insulin as well. Um, that's due to this dysfunction of pancreatic beta cells. When that happens, when you have low insulin and your body can't produce as much insulin as it used to, you'll start doing muscle catabolism and adipose tissue catabolism. Adipose catabolism is lipolysis. You're breaking down your um, fat cells and you'll release glycerol and fatty acids. Muscle catabolism involves protein breakdown and release of amino acids. Both of these will release products like amino acids and glycerol carbons that are used for gluconeogenesis. And when, you are, when, you're, when you're using these things for gluconeogenesis, the patient will then experience polyphagia, or they'll be hungry all the time, and weight loss. This makes sense. The patient's going to start to lose weight when you're breaking down their fat tissues and when you're breaking down their muscle tissues. And remember that you're breaking down these tissues because you have low insulin. You're no longer secreting as much insulin as you used to, and you're no longer sensitive to insulin like you used to be. Insulin in general is an anabolic hormone. It's a hormone that builds your body, a hormone that helps you put on weight, whether that be fat or muscle. And when you don't have insulin, you're going to break down your fat, you're going to break down your muscle, you're going to have weight loss, the patient's going to be hungry all the time because they're losing weight um, and they're not able to, to gain weight, to, to use insulin like they used to. In addition, when you have a bunch of amino acids and glycerol carbons floating around, you're going to have increased hepatic glucose output and you'll also have decreased peripheral tissue glucose uptake. This is also a, decreased, or a, a direct result of decreased insulin secretion into the blood. That's high hepatic glucose output and decreased peripheral glucose uptake. This results in hyperglycemia. So because you're using a bunch of these things for gluconeogenesis, you're gonna have a bunch of glucose hanging out in the blood. And hyperglycemia can directly cause blurred vision in addition to the macular edema that you get from the retinal vessel microangiopathy. When you have hyperglycemia, you'll also have more glucose that arrives to the kidney, specifically at the nephron for filtering. The kidney has a limit on how much glucose it can reabsorb. And once you surpass that limit, the kidney can no longer reabsorb all of the glucose in the urine. And this is when you get glycosuria, or the presence of high glucose in the urine. When you have high glucose in the urine, water tends to follow that glucose. Um, you're not going to pee out glucose alone. You can't pee out sugar, like table sugar alone. So water is going to follow, and the patient's going to be peeing a lot. That's polyuria. Peeing a lot, polyuria, leads to volume depletion and dehydration. The patient is now peeing out all their glucose, and water is following. So the patient is now dehydrated. This results in a decreased circulating blood volume, which results in an even lower blood flow, um, and you'll have even less glucose going to the nephron. So you're kind of concentrating your blood by peeing it all out, and you're concentrating all of that glucose in your blood, which kind of exacerbates the hyperglycemia. So there's a bit of a positive feedback loop, a bit of a vicious cycle going on here. You're peeing out a lot of sugar um, because you have hyperglycemia, but then water follows that sugar, which then concentrates the remaining sugar in your blood, 
and this is a dangerous cycle to be in. The dehydration also contributes to the weight loss. So when a patient with type 1 or type 2 diabetes comes in, um, oftentimes they're starved for food and they're very dehydrated, so they're low on um, their fat tissues, their muscle tissues, and of course they're low on water. It's also going to make you very thirsty. So when you're that volume depleted, you tend to get thirsty. And one mechanism for that is that when you have dehydration, you'll have hyperosmolarity in your blood and your tissues, and that'll stimulate osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus, and that'll lead to a patient drinking a lot, polydipsia. So this has been a short video on type 2 diabetes. I hope it was helpful. Most of these manifestations are common to type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and I, I would say this general part of the flowchart works for both. Um, and um, otherwise, the pathophysiology listed here is unique to type 2 diabetes. But remember that the important things to know are peripheral insulin resistance and dysfunction of pancreatic beta cells for type 2 diabetes. Hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.